March 2009, a human leg severed at the hip was found in a sports bag on farmland. Who did the leg belong to? And where was the rest of the body? Could this single body part give any clues as to what had happened to the victim? I was the on-call detective sergeant for Hertfordshire and Bedfordshire major crime team. I was at home and I received a report of a body part, or what they believed to be a body part, being found in a rural location in a village called Cotterid over in East Hertfordshire. A farmer had spotted a green bag at the edge of his field. When he looked inside, he was concerned by what he found and called 999. Uniform officers turned up at the scene, um, examined the, the object further and suspected it to be some form of human body part. The murder team were contacted, I was phoned at home and I went across to the scene. But by the time I actually got there, they'd moved the body part to the local hospital, to, to the mortuary. The leg was initially examined um, and it was in a green, a green Gulliver's holdall, wrapped in heavy blue polythene and wrapped with gaffer tape. So when the leg and its wrappings are brought into the mortuary, the first thing that's going to happen is we're going to take off all of the wrappings very carefully because they're crucial bits of forensic science evidence and we don't deal with those. What we look at is the leg. So looking at this sample leg on the digital table, the first assessment is, is it an adult leg or is it a child's leg? And we can see that it's a size that's going to fit much better with it being a male, adult left leg. The next thing is, is it Caucasian or a different ethnic group? And here, once again, the skin is white, so it's likely to be a Caucasian person that it's come from. Then we're looking for other features, like are there any marks that might be identifiable on the legs? So are there any tattoos, any marks of surgery, any evidence of implants, like knee implants and things of that sort, that might actually help us to get an identity? None of those things were present. However, there were signs of eczema. Uh, and then we'd be looking at are there any injuries? Are there any marks of it being tied, any bindings, any stabbings, any shooting, anything that would give us a clue as to what may have gone on? And finally, the one thing we'd look for is the actual site of amputation. Is this something that's surgical? Is this a clinical specimen that somebody's just dumped? But here, there's no tying off of any of the major veins or arteries. So clearly this leg has been removed by an amateur. Was it removed when they were alive or dead? We simply don't know. It was an unusual call, and so therefore it's all about being, keeping an open mind as to, to why, what was this left leg doing in Cotterid? Well, why? Or was it a stolen body part from a mortuary or something like that? Or was it indeed some macabre murder? Um, we, we weren't to know at that stage, and the most important part of my, of my role that night was just to make sure that our scene was secure so that come first, first light the following morning, um, our forensic teams um, and our crime scene managers could get in and do a, a, a proper forensic search of that crime scene. The news turned up on the wires that a body part had been found in a field in Hertfordshire. Initially, um, we thought it might be somebody who has died um, of natural causes and perhaps their body had been spread by wildlife. Um, that was the first thing. The first signs of any inquiry really are the, the golden hour principles. You know, you must secure your scene. Um, you're looking at house to house inquiry, an appeal for, for witnesses. Did anybody see the deposition of that body part? Were they driving past in their car? Did anyone see anything suspicious? Anyone loitering around, anything out of place? Being mindful that this was a very, very rural location. So we were looking for key witnesses, 
we'd be looking for CCTV. Of course, we'd have the whole area cordoned off so that our forensic team could come in and do a fingertip search of the deposition site and the surrounding area. And it's about keeping an open mind as to how did that body part and why did that body part arrive at that bizarre location. But the leg still had more truths to tell. It clearly wasn't a surgical amputation, but it's been done by someone who has some knowledge of anatomy. It's not simply been hacked off. There's been some dissection around the joint to remove the leg from the rest of the body. Quite often, in cases such as this, the individual would try and saw through the bone of the thigh. And this is the femur. It's one of the thickest, strongest bones of the whole body. And that's incredibly hard. But that's not what's happened here. What's happened is that someone with some knowledge has actually dissected around the joint to remove the leg from the rest of the body. But what the pathologist is doing now is going to be taking a sample. They're going to be taking a sample of muscle so that the DNA of the leg can be analysed. And that's what happened. And the police compared it with their own database, but there was no match. So the owner of this leg was not known to the police and remained, at that point, unidentified. Whoever that body was, whoever the deceased was, had never come into contact with the police um, and weren't registered on the national database. Even though they didn't know the cause of death, the police felt they had to treat it as a murder inquiry. But uncovering the truth wasn't going to be easy. The crux of the matter is we had a left leg. That's all we had at that stage. You know, we needed to identify who did that left leg belong to. As soon as you identify who your victim is, it naturally follows on that you're going to identify who the offenders are. But it would be another three weeks before the body of the victim was able to tell the truth about what had happened. Once the police had declared um, that it was a murder investigation, it took it to a new height. This was a very big case. It was a real who done it. An unknown person's severed leg discovered in a hedgerow and a killer who appears to know how to take a body apart. In time, would the victim's body give away the truth of what had happened? A murder investigation was now in full swing. We focused uh, quite heavily on missing persons inquiries, but uh, we didn't have a lot to go on. That was the big problem. All we had was a left leg. We couldn't give the deceased an age. We couldn't really, we knew their ethnicity. So all we knew, they were probably a white male. Um, an interesting thing was on the, on, the, on the left leg, he had quite severe eczema on his left leg. So of course that was always gonna be a, a, a method, hopefully for us to identify our victim. You know, um, was a missing person gonna be reported who suffered with severe eczema on their legs? You know, so anything like that was going to be really useful for us to sort of focus our investigation to identify who is this victim. But then a discovery was made which would blow open the investigation. A week after the severed leg was found, dog walkers uncovered a forearm in Wheat Hampstead, 25 miles away from the first discovery. That really did catapult the investigation um, to the fore, really, into the, into the media. Um, and it was, it was crucial for us to identify who is our victim. Personally, I believe that the left forearm had to have come from the same body um, as the left leg. But of course, you could assume nothing. Uh, so it was key that we had that post-mortem, um, that we were able to submit again to the National DNA Database could we match the left forearm to the left leg? Was it the same deceased, or were we talking about two victims? A second body part is found. In fact, it's a left forearm. It's brought to the mortuary, and immediately it's apparent that it's been removed with the same level of skill as the left leg. Amputating a forearm is really quite complicated, cutting through the elbow joint, and a lot of people would try and simply saw through the bone. But this bone is really hard and would take a long time. However, if you have the skill to dissect through the joint, it's much neater, quicker and simpler. 
It's also clear the hand has been taken off, presumably with an attempt to hide the identity of the individual. The key question, though, is does it match the leg? A sample of DNA is taken from the arm and it matches that from the left leg. So both limbs are from the same person. But of course, the police still don't know who that person is. The discovery of one body part was obviously sinister enough, um, but to, to the discovery of a second body part, um, some considerable distance away from where the first body part was, that was really concerning for us. From that moment, um, we felt that, oh, you know, this is something very, very serious. Well, we, we didn't know what we were dealing with. Was the offender, was the murderer playing games with us? Was he trying to, to avoid detection? Um, why, why, why these particular deposition sites? I think the general sense amongst the public at the time was that they were terrified because I think at that stage, they didn't know whether this was the beginning of a serial killer. The fact that it was, you know, one in East Hearts, uh, the next one in Central Hertfordshire, where was the next body part going to be? Then, over 100 miles away, a head appears um, in, in, in Leicestershire. Like all the other body parts, the head was found in open countryside, this time by a farmer on his land in Asfordby, near Melton Mowbray. I mean, this was a truly shocking discovery. Um, the killer had gone to great lengths um, to make sure that the victim was not identified. A decapitated head is found, but lying in the middle of a field, not wrapped up, not contained in any way. When it was brought to the mortuary, it was quite clear that there'd been a lot of activity taking place around the skull. Most of the skin was missing, the tongue was missing, eyes, ears, nose had all been taken off, presumably in an attempt to hide the identity of the individual. Further examination confirmed there was no evidence of any injury to the head or the face that could have caused the death of this individual. So we still don't know how or why he died. Two teeth were missing, but that had happened a long time ago and wasn't associated directly with the death. Next thing is, is the skull matching the arm and the leg that have already been found? Well, it does. It matches very well indeed because the strong eyebrow ridges and the solid bits of bone, the mastoid processes that can be seen at the back, all fit with this skull belonging to a male. And DNA analysis showed that the head matched the other body parts. So all of those things are fitting together. Now, how had it been removed from the body? Well, removing the skull by cutting through the, the spine is really quite complicated because the vertebrae aren't flat plates that just fit together. They actually interdigitate, they fold together, and it requires skill, care and knowledge to be able to cut between them. And that's what had happened here. So the same person had removed the skull, had removed the arm and had removed the leg. So Leicestershire contacted us to say, look, we, we, we found this skull in a field, but it's in Leicestershire. Is it going to be connected? Um, I, for one, believed it would be, uh, and I think the rest of the inquiry team were of the same vein, that how often do we find body parts scattered around rural locations of England? This had to be connected. We dispatched the team up to Leicestershire uh, to liaise with their murder inquiry team, and as a result of uh, the DNA confirmation that indeed the skull, the left leg, and the left forearm were all from one of the same body. Um, that really did uh, throw us in the mix, really. You know, why Leicestershire? Why Central Hertfordshire? Why East Hertfordshire? Who's doing this? What, what, what are the link to all these areas? I think the body parts being strewn all over um, was not what you would expect of somebody um, who has gone to such great lengths to kill someone and dismember them. Usually you would expect the body parts um, to be buried 
Um, but these were very much easy to be found. Amongst reporters, the general feeling was that this was somebody who was almost taunting the police. This was a person who was very proud of what they had done um, and, you know, wanted the publicity. It was very high profile in the media, and I think the British public, I think it certainly caught their attention. I think it was more concerning for the residents of Cotterid, for Wheat Hampstead in Hertfordshire and for Leicestershire. Those local communities must have been concerned. Why our location? What's going on here? So we, we were mindful that the communities would be concerned, but we, of course we hadn't identified who's our victim. There's a victim's family out there that need our help, but we couldn't identify them at that time. While identifying their victim was the main focus of the inquiry, police were trying everything to solve this case. The discovery of every body part and every deposition site um, and every crime scene, therefore, gave us potential to possibly identify who were our offenders. So things like all of the wrappings that the body parts were found in, they were submitted for DNA profiling, for fingerprinting, um, and so on and so forth. So no stone was left unturned, really. Well, the interesting thing about um, items that have been wrapped up as part of the commission of the crime is that the wrappings are often just as important as the actual item that they contain. It's really important to understand as much as you can about them. So you could look for the source of them, where they, who they were manufactured by, in case there are more of them. If you do identify a, a suspect's house to go and have a look at, there might be some more of these sacks. But then in terms of the traces that will be on the outside of them, well, there can be almost anything. And obviously DNA and fingerprints are really important. Um, but also things like textile fibres from clothing or from other soft furnishings, from car seats, car boots, and any other tiny particulate traces that might turn out to be relevant in this particular case. And so here, a lot of attention was paid to the wrappings themselves, the blue plastic and the sticky tape. And of course, sticky tape is, is very good in a way because it picks up things, so they would have formed a really important part of this case. There was no DNA or fingerprint evidence on the wrappings, but embedded in the tape of all the finds were distinctive green and blue fibres. Despite this, over a week into the investigation, police weren't any closer to finding out who the perpetrator was. The victim's story was yet to be told. We needed a little bit of luck, and it's often said in police investigations that you make your own luck, but uh, when was our break going to come? Our next port of call was going to be, well, you know, if we can find the hands, were we going to identify that person via fingerprints? However, the killer had already made one crucial mistake. With the deposition of the head, this is where the offenders made their first faux pas, was, of course, they left the teeth in the skull. Three times, body parts have been found strewn around the English countryside in the case that was now known as the Jigsaw Murder. The more body parts that were discovered, the more the body was able to speak its truth about what had taken place. Forensics had identified the body as being that of a white or Asian middle-aged male, but for the police there were many unanswered questions, and the killer was still on the loose. The coverage at the time was huge. Um, this was um, a very big case. The body parts turning up at um, various locations in the countryside, um, you know, it was almost like a jigsaw. I think there was pressure on the police at the time. Um, I mean, there's always pressure on the police um, in a murder investigation, but this one, you know, people really wanted the person responsible caught. And yet more pieces of the jigsaw were about to turn up. A week after the skull was found, the right leg was discovered, dumped in a lay-by on the A10 near Puckeridge, Hertfordshire. The right leg cut in two, wrapped in the blue polythene, identical to that of the, uh, the left leg. But we were obviously hoping to, for, that the hands would, would naturally follow, hopefully at some point. 
Four days later, a farmer in nearby Standen found a suitcase lying in a small ditch in his field. But the police weren't going to get fingerprint identification for this latest discovery. Saturday the 11th of April 2009 um, was the discovery of the torso um, and the remaining part of the left arm and right arm. So the torso is found. And once again, clearly that of an adult male fitting together with what had gone on. But crucially, crucially, there's significant injuries in the back. There were two stab wounds to the back which had penetrated through into the lung, a knife blade at least four inches long. And in fact, the lungs are very, very close to the skin surface. Just one stab wound into the lung can cause the death and it could easily have resulted from a knife that was four inches long. The victim's body had revealed the truth and the cause of death finally had been established on this body. There was no evidence of any struggle, no evidence of any fight, no evidence of any other injury. So it looks as though two stab wounds in the back had been delivered when the person was either lying down or simply from behind them. So we now knew that, yes, this was murder, that we'd recovered nearly all of our body parts other than the hands, and that it was two stab wounds to the back. Um, now it was crucial for us to identify exactly who that victim was. And then we had a case for murder. Three days later, and three weeks since the first body part was found, the police made an appeal to the public. I'm dealing with a horrific murder here. I need the public's help to help me identify who the victim is. We can now confirm the cause of death which was a stab wound to the back. The man is to be believed to be of white, Asian, or of mixed heritage, between the heights of five foot six and five foot 10. It was a direct result of our press appeal from that conference. We received a telephone call uh, from a gentleman who stated that his brother had been missing uh, for some weeks, um, and his brother was Geoffrey Howe. He fit the criteria. He was the right age, the right ethnicity, the right weight. He had eczema, and we knew that from the, the eczema on our left leg um, that was first discovered at Cotterid. Um, and as soon as we started making our initial inquiries into Geoffrey Howe, we soon established that he'd been missing since March of that year, that no one had seen him, and uh, just hadn't turned up for work one day. Jeffrey Howe was a kitchen salesman. And his family said sometimes he did have like a little bit of a temper uh, at times. Um, but generally, everybody who knew him spoke warmly about him. Um, we knew that he lived in Southgate, which is an area of North London. He had lived in a, a two bedroom flat. Um, initially alone, but then we, we established from our uh, sort of early inquiries that he had a, a male uh, and a female living with him. Um, and they'd moved in some weeks or months previously, and they were friends of his. Um, and the name Stephen Marshall uh, came up in the investigation. I was shocked to hear that because I, I knew of a Stephen Marshall from my early policing days, um, who was quite a, he was a criminal quite a concerning character, quite a formidable character in his own right. Um, and th that stage, I thought, well, it, it can't be one of the same. But uh, a few further inquiries established that it was indeed the same Stephen Marshall. Stephen Marshall was very much an imposing figure, very much a man-mountain of a, a character. Um, and, you know, he used to boast that he had a 52-inch chest um, he was so big, and anybody who ever met him uh, knew they were in his presence. He was quite an intimidating character, very imposing, very, very well built, um, very fit, um, and would come across as very charismatic and very friendly at first, but um, was without doubt, I would probably describe him as a bully would probably really aptly describe Stephen Marshall as a nasty bully um, of the criminal fraternity. 
Stephen Marshall had moved into Jeffrey's flat along with his girlfriend, Sarah Bush. Sarah Bush was a very petite figure. Um, she'd also worked as a, um, a sex worker um, and she'd managed to meet uh, Marshall. Um, apparently, um, he stopped paying and then he was very much a big, imposing figure um, on her life and pretty much controlled her. Stephen and and, um, and Jeffrey had met through 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 the kitchen business, through uh, kitchen sales. Um, both were very successful in, in kitchen sales. I think Stephen Marshall probably had uh, had the gift of the gab, as it were, and they seemed to hit it off. Sarah Bush and Stephen Marshall had moved into Jeffrey Howe's flat just for a short term initially. Um, and Jeffrey Howe, which is, appears to be typical of Jeffrey, was just doing them a favour, just being a good friend to them. Um, but no, they exploited that friendship. Um, and initially they were paying a small amount of, of, of peppercorn rent, but eventually stopped paying any money to Jeffrey at all. After a week of gathering intelligence, police decided to investigate Geoffrey Howe's address in person. Well, I took a team of officers to Southgate, where Geoffrey Howe lived. As soon as I knocked on the door, it was answered by none other than, than Stephen Marshall. I obviously immediately recognised Stephen. He's uh, quite an intimidating character, but he was very friendly with us, invited us into the premises, and we sat down at the kitchen table. Both Stephen and Sarah portrayed themselves as good friends of Geoffrey, um, but really couldn't offer any firm explanation as to why he'd gone missing, why he'd just left and not been in contact with them. Uh, they were very sketchy about any detail, which as a, as a detective is always a, rings the alarm bells for us, and they weren't at all concerned about him. So um, we just asked if we could have a look around the flat, as we would do on a, on a, on a routine missing person inquiry. And it was then that we saw uh, the number plates for Geoffrey Howe's vehicle. Um, he had a private number plate. Um, and those number plates were in the master bedroom, which was unusual because obviously the car wasn't outside the address and they'd said that he'd taken the car um, when the last time they'd seen him. Um, nothing was ringing true. There was, there was, there was no master bed in the, in the bedroom. There was a, a blue inflatable blow-up mattress on the floor. Um, things just weren't right. Um, and things they were saying, explanations they were giving about their last sightings and about their relationship to Stephen just were clearly just weren't ringing true and were a pack of lies. So um, I just made an excuse to leave. Went outside, I immediately phoned the uh, detective superintendent. <laughs> just explains my gut feeling, really, and the rationale around it. Um, we had options. We put them under some form of surveillance, or uh, were we going to let them run um, and just see what happens? Um, but the risk was, was, was too extreme for us, as far as we were concerned, and the decision was rightly made that we should arrest them there and then. Uh, so that's what we did. We took the other officers back into the flat, um, and that's when I arrested Sarah Bush and Stephen Marshall for the, uh, for the murder of Geoffrey Howe. This was a bold move, considering they hadn't even confirmed that it was Geoffrey Howe's body strewn across the country. They had 24 hours to charge them or let them go. They were both interviewed under caution. Um, both had solicitors, as is their right. That is Geoffrey Howe. Do you deny or confirm that to Geoffrey Howe? No comment. Do you recognise that person to be Geoffrey Howe? No comment. I believe he was a friend or an associate of yours. No comment. And my understanding is he's been quite kind to you in the past by allowing you to stay at his home address. No comment. Stephen Marshall went no comment to all questions asked of him. Now, bearing in mind that he portrayed Geoffrey Howe to be one of his best mates, that they lived together, 
Um, we were uh, suggesting, um, and it was our suspicion that, 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 that um, Stephen Marshall was responsible for his murder, and we were accusing Stephen Marshall of murdering Geoffrey Howe. Are you responsible for the killing and the dismembering of your friend no Geoffrey Howe? If so, why did you kill and dismember Geoffrey Howe? If he was an innocent man, you would expect him to shout from the rooftops, that, you know, that I'm an innocent man, I've not done this. Um, he would do everything possible to try and help us identify who had. And do you feel upset by the fact that not only has he been murdered, but someone's chosen to dismember him and place parts of his body around the countryside? No comment. How does that make you feel? No comment. But no, uh, Stephen Marshall refused to help us in any way. No comment. With time not on their side, and Marshall not cooperating, the police needed concrete evidence or their suspects would have to be released. While Sarah Bush and Stephen Marshall were in police custody at Hatfield, our fast-track inquiry was to, uh, to send Geoffrey Howe's dental records to an expert, along with the teeth from the skull that had been recovered from Leicestershire. It was interesting that despite all the effort that had been taken to remove the nose, the ears, the tongue, the teeth had been left in the skull. And teeth can often be used to identify someone. And so the police asked a specialist forensic dentist, a forensic odontologist, to come in and to have a look in the hope that a positive identification could be made. If police couldn't find a match and confirm the victim as Geoffrey Howe, they'd have to release their suspects the next morning. We only have them for 24 hours, so time is of the essence. After body parts had been found strewn across the countryside, a man called Geoffrey Howe was reported missing, and police arrested his lodgers, Sarah Bush and Stephen Marshall. Even dismembered, the body had given the truth of what had happened with the discovery of stab wounds in the torso. But the police still had to positively identify the victim. Fortunately, they had his teeth. We had fast-tracked Geoffrey Howe's dental records to an expert and also fast-tracked the, the dental impressions of the recovered skull from Leicestershire. And that dental expert was able to, to confirm 100% that, yes, our victim was Geoffrey Howe, and that was the first time in the investigation, and a big breakthrough for us. So now almost all of the body had been recovered. The only significant things that were missing were the two hands. And the torso had given evidence of the two stab wounds to the back, which undoubtedly were the cause of death. One had penetrated right through into the lungs and would have caused extensive bleeding into the chest cavity itself. Interestingly, stab wounds to the chest often don't bleed much externally. All the bleeding is contained. But when the body was dismembered, when the head was cut off and the limbs were removed, their major blood vessels would have been cut through and blood would have leaked passively out of the body, causing extensive blood staining of the area. It is extremely difficult to clean up a crime scene of all blood, especially where quite a lot has been shed. Blood spatter, because it goes everywhere, you could easily miss tiny, tiny spots, which forensic scientists will find with their powerful lamps and, <laughs> you know, chemical tests and all the rest of it. Um, so it is really difficult to clean up. And then, of course, if you try to use water or anything like that, you know, sloshing it all over the place, you're diluting it. And it, while you might not be able to see it, we will still be able to detect it. So it's really difficult. The flat was locked down as, our, as a crime scene. Um, and our forensic team uh, spent many, many days there uh, carrying out a very thorough um, search of the address and albeit that, that Sarah Bush and Stephen Marshall had tried um, to do a very very good clean-up job. When we took up the, the, the carpets, the underlay, the floorboards, the skirting boards and so on and so forth, we found a significant amount of blood. They found a lot of blood in the bedroom but then there was also blood in the bathroom and it's more difficult to control um, blood in somewhere like a bedroom than it is in the bathroom. 
and the pattern of blood staining that they found told them exactly what had gone on where. A key line of inquiry was to match that blood to that of, um, of Geoffrey Howe. DNA analysis confirms that the DNA we found in significant volumes um, inside the flat was a positive match, 100%, to that of the body parts found scattered around the rural locations. And it was a result of that forensic um, examination that we identified that the master's bedroom was indeed the, uh, the scene of the murder and indeed was the scene of the dismemberment. Police could now charge Stephen Marshall and Sarah Bush for the murder of Geoffrey Howe. Within days of their arrest, um, police announced that they had been charged um, with murder, which was a real shock. The two appeared in magistrate's court um, on the Saturday morning, um, and they were then remanded in custody to face trial. I think there was some relief from the public. Two people had been charged with his murder, and perhaps this was the conclusion of the case. I think there were a lot of unanswered questions um, about why would somebody kill Geoffrey Howe, who had only shown kindness um, by allowing these two people to stay in his flat. To build a case that would stand up in court, there was still a lot of investigation needed. For every crime, it's imperative that we, we prove beyond all reasonable doubt what is the motive for this crime? Is it jealousy? Is it greed? Is it drug-related? Is it crime-related in any way? Um, and very, very quickly, we established that, in actual fact, the murder of Geoffrey Howe was simply about finances and greed. We established that within hours of Geoffrey Howe's murder, Stephen Marshall had started um, writing checks from Geoffrey Howe's checkbook, taking out cash and monies from, from, from Geoffrey's bank account. They sold his car. They'd set up online uh, shopping accounts. They'd purchased takeaway pizzas. And, and basically, just as soon as they'd got rid of Geoffrey, just plundered his assets and plundered his bank accounts to their own ends. Stephen Marshall had even gone to the extent of uh, utilising Geoffrey Howe's personalised car number plates to put over the top of his number plates on his car um, to carry out a theft of petrol at a local petrol station. The private number plates that I'd seen in the flat um, on the day of uh, Stephen Marshall's arrest. The evidence was overwhelming, and crucially, all the forensics gathered from the body parts also matched up. The fibres evidence was particularly powerful. Some of the links with the actual house itself involved three mattresses that were there. They, were, they had this um, flopped surface. It's like peach skin. It's very soft to the touch, a bit like very short velvet. And some of the fibres on the wrappings and body parts related to that, these three mattresses. And then there was some really powerful evidence to link, um, again, the body parts and the wrappings with um, a green polo shirt that belonged to um, Stephen Marshall, one of the defendants. Um, and they were of two different kinds. So they were polyester, green polyester fibres and green cotton fibres. And so that immediately makes the evidence more powerful. A clear image finally emerged of what had actually happened. On the night of the murder, Stephen Marshall entered Geoffrey Howe's bedroom, stabbed him in the back, and left him to bleed to death. He later returned to dismember the body. We couldn't have had a stronger case, really. We had, we had our motive, the fact that, um, and we'd evidence that Sarah Bush and Stephen Marshall had plundered all of Geoffrey Howe's finances. Stephen Marshall's fingerprints were on a receipt that he supplied to the a man who brought uh, Geoffrey Howe's car. We proved the fact that um, Stephen Marshall was in that flat at the time, and the fact that, that the flat was indeed the murder scene and the scene of the dismemberment.
we had extensive fibre evidence to show that Stephen Marshall's T-shirts must have been in that room at the time that the dismembered body parts were being wrapped up in those blue rubble sacks. We couldn't have been in a stronger position. On the 12th of January 2010, Stephen Marshall and Sarah Bush were tried at St Albans Crown Court. What was quite interesting was um, Marshall and Bush, who were sat next to each other in the dock, barely spoke a word to each other. Um, considering they were lovers, um, why was there no, why were they so cold towards each other? At the time of Geoffrey Howe's murder, we don't actually believe that Sarah Bush was present at the flat at the time. She had actually extracted herself away from the premises and gone to visit a friend. Nevertheless, um, it was always our case that Sarah Bush was complicit in everything that happened, was involved in the, in the planning, the preparation, and, and of course, the disposal of all the body parts with Stephen Marshall. Both Marshall and Bush pleaded not guilty, um, despite the weight of the evidence against them. Stephen Marshall had admitted chopping up Geoffrey Howe's body, but denied murder. The details of the case were truly grisly, um, but Marshall and Bush showed absolutely no remorse, um, no upset. As the trial proceeded, um, Marshall and Bush started to blame each other, um, very much turning in on each other um, over, over who killed Jeffrey, who had dismembered him, um, who'd got rid of the body parts. And it was very much the first emotion that we'd seen, which literally to blame each other. But no one was prepared for the next turn of events. Three weeks into the trial, we were all called into court in the morning and Marshall asked for the um, charge to be put to him again. And this time he pleaded guilty. I mean, that's really shocking. To admit murder when you're going to get a life sentence is like signing your life away. I think it's open to different theories why he decided that he was going to plead guilty at the very last minute. Um, was this him? deciding that he wanted to completely clear the slate? Um, was this him playing the system, pleading guilty at the very last minute once he'd seen the overwhelming case against him, knowing that he also gets a discount in his sentence? Um, or was there some pressure put on him to plead guilty by people in the criminal underworld? Then came perhaps the biggest revelation of all, Stephen Marshall didn't just leave it there, uh, you know, after pleading guilty. He then decided um, that he was going to get his QC to stand up in court during his sentencing and confessed that he'd cut up four more bodies. Not only that, but he'd worked for one of the biggest crime families in London, the Adams family, um, and he had been disposing of people who had double-crossed them. I mean, it, it, it was truly... Um, a shocking um, revelation. On Monday, 1st of February 2010, Stephen Marshall was convicted of the murder of Geoffrey Howe and given a life sentence. He would have to serve at least 36 years before he could apply for parole. Sarah Bush was sentenced to three and a half years for perverting the course of justice. It was a difficult investigation, um, but I'm immensely proud of not just my work, but that, that of the team, because it really was a team investigation that resulted in that successful outcome. It was certainly one of the most disturbing, um, you know, court cases that I think I've ever covered. So immensely proud um, and so glad that we managed to get justice for uh, for for the family, really. With the case concluded and the killer in jail, the last piece of the puzzle was in place. The autopsy had provided the information they needed, the stab wound to the back, the teeth, and even the eczema on the leg. 
In the end, Jeffrey Howe's body had revealed the truth. And the jigsaw was complete.